thank God for His amazing grace. And I appreciate that song, good singing. I appreciate the Spirit of the Lord. I'm glad it's more than just a sound, but there's a, there's a touch of God. And I'm thankful that uh, the truth of that song as well. I thank God that the Bible says He's the God of all grace. And uh, He is... We're, the Bible teaches us in Romans chapter 5, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, that we're living in grace. And that's where we dwell at. We move around just God's grace in our lives. God's grace, it's unfathomable, it's unsearchable, there's no end to it. And I'm glad His grace will take us right on into the glory world and you and I in this present time, we fear death a lot of times. I know I do. I, I'm not afraid of where I'm going when I die because I know my name's written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. But uh, you and I, I believe, we'd all have to agree that uh, when we think about death, it's a strange thought because it's a place where we've never been. And uh, it's really the fear of the unknown. And I'm, uh, and I, well, I sometimes I think about death, and I, I'm one. I want to live as long as God will allow me to. But I've often heard testimony. I've even sat and watched as as people have taken their last breath. I've been over uh, my great grandmother. She drew her last breath. She was looking far beyond the loved ones that was gathered around her. And Brother Bill, she seemed to be in such a place of peace. And I mean, looking at her frail, uh, dying body, it was hard to uh, understand. Uh, and, and some of the ones that was gathered around, Mama always, she uh, was dying is exactly what she's doing, but, but uh, they were talking to her. And she wasn't, she wasn't recognizing them. She wasn't acknowledging them. Uh, she would just had this far off look in her eyes. But she is at peace. Why? Because God's grace had stepped in. And you and I may fear death now. We may wonder about death. We may have mixed emotions about death. I'm, I'm trusting that we all know where we're going. And we've all been saved and we know that. But uh, when it comes time to die, there'll be grace that will be there to carry you on over the other side. Because I've often wondered how in the world... People get uh, a terminal illness, and there's nothing the doctors can do. If God don't intervene, they're going to pass away, and they, they just have peace about it. And I think, how in the world can somebody live like that, and knowing that your days are drawing nine, and have such peace? There's grace. And I thank God for His grace this morning. Most of all, I thank God for His saving grace. Well, take your Bibles. Turn with me to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter number 1. And I don't have a whole lot. If the Lord don't help me, I'll be preaching short. But uh, if the Lord will help me, I'm going to try to make up for lost time. Amen. Y'all smile, laugh, even if you don't say amen. But I'm not, I'm not going to. I don't want to tarry too long. Sometimes I feel like Pharaoh. You remember in the Old Testament, old Moses came and said, Pharaoh, let my people go. I've sat in church services listening to preachers preach an hour and a half, and I think to my mind, Lord, let my people go. We got to go. I don't want to wear you out this morning, but I do have an interesting thought, and uh, the Lord showed me something. I've never noticed this. We were sitting in church, and God revealed this to me. I really believe that God, the Holy Ghost, spoke to my heart. I've read these verses in the book of 1 Peter. I've also read there's some other text verses I'm going to read from this morning. You won't have to turn there if you'll just listen real close. But uh, read all these verses many times, and I've never noticed this. And God uh, shared with me some truth, and I want to just lay on you what God's laid on me this morning. First Peter chapter number one. If you're there, say Amen. amen. If you want to, and you're able, we'll stand as we reverence God's word. Uh, we're going to begin reading in verse number three. Peter says, "Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ." which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, 
Go now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. I'm glad that we can rejoice even in the midst of our heaviness that we face in life. And verse number 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Y'all stay with me now. Verse 10 of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that, could, that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which is in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. I've read all that to get to this next phrase in verse number 12. The Bible says, the, uh, uh, I will now have lost my... Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things, verse 12, which things the angels desire to look into. You can be seated this morning. Peter begins to lay out the first book of the Bible that he wrote, that he was the author of. He begins by expounding on some great truths that you and I enjoy. He begins to preach about our salvation. He's writing about our security. He's writing about our sanctification. He is opening up this, uh, this book that he authored uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Beginning uh, there in verse number three, he writes about some benefits that you and I get to enjoy. Uh, he even says that those Old Testament prophets, they search diligently. Uh, uh, they I what you and I had because you understand in the Old Testament they were justified in the sight of God by God's grace and through their faith. It, salvation has never uh, never changed. It doesn't matter if you go back to the book of Genesis or you go to the book of Revelation. Uh, salvation always has been uh, and always will be by grace uh, uh, through faith. There's a select group of people out there and, and I mean they mean well and they come out of good churches and they're good preachers and they're good teachers uh, uh, but yet they believe that Brother Bill that in the Old Testament salvation was by works uh, uh, but what are they going to do with the book of Romans where, where Paul said Abraham believed God he simply believed uh, and he obtained imputed righteousness uh, uh, so salvation's always been by grace through faith the difference was uh, you and I get to enjoy the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God would sometimes move on individuals and he would aid them and he would help them. He would protect them. But then afterwards, he would remove himself from that individual. The Holy Ghost did not permanently indwell. And But yet there was prophecies and prophets preached about the day when the Spirit of God would dwell within his people and they searched and they sought for it. But here you and I, we sit this morning with, with God living on the inside of us. Boy, ain't that amazing. And so Peter, he's talking about the benefits that you and I get to enjoy in this dispensation of grace in this church age. He talks about the prophets and how they sought for it. They searched and they uh, looked and they longed uh, to enjoy what you and I get to enjoy. But then in verse number 12, why don't you notice what he says? This is uh, very important for you to understand the foundation of today's message hinges on verse number 12. The Bible says, which things the angels desire 
to look into. Which things the angels desire to look into in order to understand where I'm going with this. You've got to understand a few, uh, a few things about the angels that I'm talking about. And you know the Bible tells us a lot about angels. Uh, the Bible says this in a very familiar passage of Scripture in the book of Isaiah in chapter number 6. Isaiah chapter 6, verse number 2 and 3. Don't turn there. If you will, just listen real close. You can write them down and go back and check me and make sure I'm not lying to you. But uh, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2 and 3 says, uh, uh, this was in the year that King Uzziah died and, and Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up and the Bible says above it, he's talking about the throne where the Lord was lifted up at, Above it stood the seraphims, each one, these are angels, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. Talking about them seraphim, they had six wings, and, and two of their wings covered their feet, and, and two of their wings covered their face, and two wings they fly. With those two wings they fly around heaven, and they're doing something. They're not just uh, flying around in circles, but the Bible says, uh, and one cried to another. So we got we got one angel crying to another angel and said, "Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of of his glory. Now to understand and paint you a mental image of what's going on, uh, uh, there's this six winged angel that's flying around heaven uh, and uh, he's crying, they cry one to another uh, uh, back and forth day and night holy, holy, holy. You say preacher, what are they doing? Uh, oh, well they're worshiping God. Uh, uh, they're crying out holy, holy, holy. Now you said preacher or you might say preacher. How long have they done that? I believe based upon the scriptures, and I'm going to show you this, they've been doing it since they were created. And they ain't stopped doing it. And if we were to look into heaven right now, Brother Bill, they'd still be crying, holy, holy, holy. You say, can you prove that? Well, the book of Revelation chapter number 4 and verse number 8 says this, when John saw for one is come up hither and I'll show you the things which must be hereafter. That's the rapture of the church. John is caught up in a vision. He's seeing into heaven. He saw the 24 elders. That was you and I. And he's seeing a future image of what is to come. And the Bible says, And there was four beasts, and the four beasts had each of them six wings. Now, in the book of Isaiah, chapter number six, how many wings did them angels have? Uh, uh, they had six. Then John is seeing a vision, and he calls them beasts. Uh, uh, but he says they had six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night. Meaning, they don't ever stop. Uh, they rest not day and night uh, and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was uh, and is and is to come. Uh, now if I just take the Bible for what it says and I believe the word of God, I believe that the same beast that John saw is the same angel that Isaiah saw uh, and they've got six wings and I'm going somewhere with this so y'all stay with me. Uh, they've got six wings and, and with two of those wings they cover their face. Uh, and if they're doing their job and they've been doing their job since the beginning of creation, uh, uh, that means day and night 24 hours a day and uh, in, in, in our time which you know up there there's no time uh, uh, but as long as they've been created, as long as they've been there day and night uh, uh, they worship a God They've never saw. Y'all think about that. They worship a God. The Bible says in Revelation 4, 8, that these beasts, these angels that had six wings, they're crying, holy, holy, holy. They were full of eyes within. I always wonder what in the world did, did John mean by that? And then the Lord showed me this. Their eyes, they've got full of eyes. They're, they, they, they're, they got eyes, but they keep them covered with their wings. 
Now, if they've did their job and they've never and they've never quit doing what they've done in the scriptures, they've worshipped a God from creation, Brother Bill, yet they've never laid eyes on him. Now y'all think about that. Now I want to show you something and then I'll give you my thought. Here are some created beings and they've worshipped a God they've never saw. And the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, the angels desire to look into. Now the Bible tells us also in the book of Isaiah that to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? That means God has revealed Himself to man. The Bible tells us that we have beheld the glory of God. How? In the only begotten Son. You say, well, I've never laid eyes on, on Jesus Christ. My physical eyes have never seen Him. Well, is He not the Word? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning. And so we have the Word of God. It reveals unto us the person of God. It reveals unto us the Son of God. It reveals unto us the Spirit of God. You and I have some benefits that even the angels, don't have. And I want to preach this for a moment on some things the angels desire. There's some things that you and I have, you and I have been made partakers of, that even the angels don't know anything about. You say, preacher, what in the world is this going to do for us, knowing that we've got benefits that the angels... Well, if the angels are willing to worship God day and night since their creation... And they'll continue doing that until, until throughout all eternity as far as the Scriptures are concerned. If they're willing to do that, how much more ought we to worship God? Because in reality, when I get done, I'm hoping I'll show you where God's been better to us than He's been even to His angels. First of all, according to the Scriptures, Peter said there that, 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 that which things the angels desire to look to. Peter is speaking in verse 12 about the preceding benefits that he's already spoke about. First of all, they desire to look into our salvation. The Bible says, 1 Peter in chapter 3, or chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible un and undefiled that, that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. You and I when we read 1 first, uh, first Peter chapter 1 um, uh, we, we come to uh, the, the first thing that Peter begins to talk about is our salvation and the angels have a desire to know what it is to be redeemed. Um, I, wanna, I want you to think about this. The Bible says in the very familiar verse John 316 for God so loved the world. Uh, who was he talking about? He was talking about you and I. He was talking about every person that ever had lived and ever would live and that was currently living. Uh, I'm thankful that salvation is free to all that will call upon the Lord. Uh, uh, the Bible says for whosoever shall call upon the Lord uh, uh, shall be saved. I'm glad this morning that I was one of them uh, who the Lord died for on the cross of Calvary. Uh, I'm glad I know that I've been saved. I've got eternal life and I'm not holding out to the end to see whether or not I was one of the chosen. I, I became one of the chosen when I got saved. I, I became one of the elect when I got saved. I, and I was predestined the moment that I got born again. I was predestined to be conformed uh, to the image of His Son. Uh, all of those terms, they don't bother me. They don't scare me. In reality, uh, uh, all those those things took place after I got saved. Ain't that right? When I got saved, when you got saved, the moment you took and placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to the saving of your soul, at that moment you was predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. 
That's what the Bible teaches. And what that means is ultimately when we get finished, when we reach the finish line, we cross over into eternity, what's going to happen is we're going to be given a glorified body. And we shall see Him as He is. And the Bible says because of that we shall be like Him. And I want you to think about this. So man fell in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve, they, they sinned, their eyes was open, they become guilty before God, they went, they hid themselves, they tried to sew themselves some fig leaves together. And many people are doing that today. They're trying to get up, work up some salvation or some man-made ritual to try to cover up their sin and, and try to get rid of their guilt. But uh, I'm glad God is the only one that can do that. Uh, and uh, so they, they fell in the Garden of Eden and God saw uh, that they had failed. They they had hid themselves. God come in the cool of the day, said, Adam, where art thou? Adam popped up, said, I hid myself for his name. He said, Who told that to who told you that I was naked? And and uh, he said, The woman that you gave me is the one that got us in this mess. That's what Adam said. And the Bible said that God made them coats of skin. So what God did was he went out there and he took an animal, he shed its blood, and clothed them in righteousness that he prepared. You say, preacher, what is that? Well, that's what, you, that's what he did for us. What he did, Brother Bill, was he, instead of offering up a lamb or some animal, he gave us his only begotten son, a Jesus Christ. And he offered him a sacrifice. And, uh, and then when Jesus ascended back to the Father, he's clothed us in the righteousness of his Son. Now, now we're talking about angels this morning. You remember sometime, sometime back, I believe, listen, I know these questions and there's no Bible clarity on this, but I've been asked when did Satan or Lucifer at that time, when did the fall of Lucifer take place? Now, I'm going to tell you what my opinion is. This is my opinion. Give you something to think about. Consider what I say. The Lord did give the understanding what the Scripture says. There's no way to prove this. You can't prove it. I can't prove it. Nobody can prove it. But I believe that Adam, when he was sometime, while he was in the Garden of Eden, and he was giving names to all them, the Bible don't say how long Adam had been there. The Bible doesn't say how long he was there before the fall. We, we, we don't know, but sometime after, after the creation of man, Lucifer, is sitting in heaven and, and God has created the human race and, and, and at that point it was Adam and Eve to worship him and, uh, and Lucifer one of the archangels became jealous of God and said I will I will make myself equal with God. People say he wanted to esteem himself higher than God. You can't get no higher than God. He said I want to be equal with God and so he led a rebellion one third of heaven he carried away and uh, the Lord cast him out into to the earth and, and then at some point after his casting out he appeared before Adam and Eve and he beguiled them but I got to thinking about this brother Bill when the fall of that angelic number took place God never did redeem them God never did send his son to die for them as a matter of fact according to the scriptures he reserved some of them that kept not their first estate, he reserved some of them in chains and outer darkness. Some of them he reserved in chains and outer darkness. In other words, he didn't love them the same way he loved you and I. Brother Bill, when I got to thinking about that, it done something for me. God cared more about you and I when we fell. And you say, preacher, I wasn't there when Adam and Eve fell. Yeah, but you're guilty of Adam's sin. You're guilty of Adam's transgression according to the book of Romans. Uh, uh, we are all guilty this morning, but yet God uh, uh, loved you and I enough that he would send his only begotten son uh, uh, to shed his life's blood, take upon himself the form of a man, uh, uh, took our handwriting of ordinances, took our sin upon him, uh, and was crucified. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was... He was, uh, he was stripped of his royalty. Amen. All so that you and I could be saved. Now you know there's some angel somewhere that's thinking in his mind. I'm just, I'm, I'm giving, painting you a picture. There's an angel somewhere thinking, Lord, why didn't you do that for us? 
And then those angels that are still in heaven flying around crying, Holy, Holy, Holy. They see uh, in John's vision there in, in Revelation chapter number 4, he sees these and they, they're, they're singing a song. There's going to come a day where the angels that are crying, Holy, 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 Brother Bill, they're going to stop. And every one of them angels that's worshipped the Lord throughout all of eternity, all of them, they're going to stop. And they're going to be silent. And then those 24 elders are going to stand up. And we're going to sing a song. And it's not that the angels don't know it. It's that they cannot sing it. Because we're going to worship the Lord and sing a song according to the book of Revelation about the redemption and the blood that purchased us. And so we're going, to sing an, we're going to sing a song that the angels cannot sing. Why? Because they, they desire to look into it, the salvation. Verse number 5, it talks about our security. Peter begins to talk about in verse number 5, in chapter 1, he says, Who, talking about you and I, the saved, those that's been born again, who are kept by the power of God through faith. That ought to do away with all of our doubts, all of our fears. And I'll go a step further and say all of our feelings. If you're going by the way you feel and you get up on Monday and you say, Preacher, I just don't feel saved. Or you may sit here this morning and you say, Preacher, I just don't feel saved. If I went on how I felt, I'd be lost about six days a week if I went by how I feel. The only day I really feel saved is when I'm at church on Sunday twice. You say, well, what about Wednesday? Sometimes I wonder. But on Sunday, I feel saved. But there's a lot of times, Brother Bill, I don't feel saved, but I'm glad I'm not saved by the way I feel. I'm glad I'm not secure by the way I feel. I'm glad I'm not secure. By, I'm secured by Jesus Christ. I'm sealed under the day of redemption. I'm sealed. I'm saved. I'm sealed. I am secure, and I'm kept by the power of God. Amen. Now, them that... Them that believes that you can be saved today and lost tomorrow, the only thing I can say is they live a miserable life. Because if I truly believed that, I'd try to get saved every day just to be sure I had it. And I've got family this morning that believes it that way. And now just because they believe they can lose it, listen, don't mean they don't have it. I believe some of them's truly I believe most of them, I, I believe it'll keep them living closer to God than what a lot of times you and I are, if I'm being honest about it. But I'm glad I don't have to go to bed at night wondering whether or not God still loves me. I, I, listen, I make mistakes and you do too. We've all come short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And, and when, when the Bible says all, it means all. Every one of us, we've messed up since we've been saved. You've made mistakes since you've been saved, but I'm glad I'm not kept by my works. I'm kept by the power of God. You say, preacher, what does that have to do with them angels? Well, the angels desire to have our security. There was no security when a third of heaven decided they was going to follow Lucifer in his rebellion to try to esteem himself equal with God, according to the book of Isaiah. Uh, there, was, there was no security in place. Just because they had messed up and made the bad uh, decision, made a mistake in following Lucifer, there was, there was no security plan, Brother Bill. And uh, when, 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 they, when the Lord cast, when God cast them out of heaven, that was, that, was, that was the end of it for them. But I'm thankful that you and I, even though we've made mistakes and we've messed up and we've done things contrary to the will of God and we've, we, we, we've succumbed to the temptations of the devil, and, uh, we have followed the same one that the angels followed when they fell. And, and God did not turn us away. Boy, ain't you glad of that this morning? I mean, you think about it. The same one that tempted those angels and told them whatever he told them to get them on his side is the same one that'll come to you and I about on a daily basis and lead us away and try to lead us astray. And there's been times we have did the same thing that them angels did in heaven. We followed that same voice and we've come under the attack of that same 
a being, but yet God still loves us. They desire to look into our salvation. They desire to look into our security. And then they desire to look into our sanctification. The Bible says this in 1 Peter, and I'm closing, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be. Sometimes we, we don't always understand it, and I don't always enjoy it, but sometimes it's needful. Heaviness, trials are needed at times. And I know this is a cliche saying, it's been said for a long time, but, but if there was no valleys, we would never enjoy the mountaintops. If there was no problem, if there's never a bad time, we wouldn't know what a good time was. So sometimes they're needed. And, and, and Peter says, wherein you greatly rejoice. Well, how in the world can we rejoice when we come under manifold temptations and heaviness of heart? When we're faced, in verse 7, we're faced with a trial. When it seems like God has put us in the refiner's flames. Y'all ever felt like that? Because you know he's talking about gold. And the refined gold, I've watched there's these weird videos on Facebook now when you're scrolling through and, and they make jewelry. And it just pops up. And I've watched them take gold and, and they take old rings and earrings and, and next and they, they put that gold in that refiner's fire and it melts it down and then they take a little old spoon, Brother Bill, and they take and they scrape, they skim off the top what isn't gold. It's not pure. And they make it pure gold through that fire. But there's heat involved. It's it's hard on that gold. But that's what God has to do to you and I. At times, He'll take and put us in that refiner's fire right? and we're come under manifold temptations and we're faced with trials and it brings a heaviness upon our hearts and we wonder how in the world can Peter say we can rejoice in the midst of those battles. And I believe they some angels in heaven when they look down at earth and, and, and these angels all around us. Do you know that? Angels and demons are everywhere. You say, preacher, can you, can you prove that with the Bible? Yeah. There's been times you might have entertained an angel and not been aware of it. That's what the Bible says. Is it not entertain angels? Some, sometimes we entertain. And then uh, Satan himself is transformed in the, into an angel of light. And no marvel, the Bible says, his helpers. I'll say it. I'm paraphrasing. He said, no, I, I can't quote it just right, but he says, even those that are on, them demons are sometimes transformed themselves into ministers of righteousness. Well, why, where and all, where, where, where's all that happening? Right around us. And they look at you and I, and they see a group of humans. We're nothing like an angel. We can't fly, we, can't, we don't have wings. We've never been in the presence of God. And if you ever read about the description of Lucifer when he was in heaven, and the Bible tells us, I believe it's in the book of Ezekiel, it talks about Lucifer and how the Lord fashioned him. He's not the red man with a forked tail and holding a pitchfork with horns. He's not. He's a beautiful creature. He's one of the, one of the three archangels. And don't you think that these times they look at us and they fly around heaven crying and worship a God that they've never saw and they look down here at, at the human race and they see you and I and how the Lord comes to us in, in the form of His Spirit and comforts us in our time of trouble. When we're going through valleys, His Spirit guides us. When we face temptation and the devil shows up, there's a Spirit there that leads us into the path of righteousness. Don't you know them angels desired? They desired to see and to be partakers of the benefits that you and I enjoy. Miss Vicky, if you'll come to the piano, some things the angels desire. Our salvation our security, our sanctification. If there's anything this morning that we ought to take away from today's message, 
if those angels are willing to worship God who they've never saw, a God that they've never experienced the way you and I have experienced Him, how much more ought we to be willing to worship Him? As we stand this morning, first of all, as I look around, I believe that all of us have a testimony, but that is between you and God. I don't know anybody's heart. Only God does. It's between you and the Lord, but if you're, if you're not saved, you need to be. Because He's done something for you that He didn't do for His angels. He gave His only begotten Son. Jesus Christ died upon a cross so that you by faith could be redeemed. That word begotten, it means He's called us. It gives, if I were to illustrate it, to be begotten means you've been taken from from one family and grafted in to another family. One place in the scripture, it's the writer calls it, you've been adopted. He sent His Son that you could be free from your sin. And if you are saved this morning, you ought to worship the Lord and be thankful because God has done some things for you and I that He's not done for those other created beings. It may not do much for you, but when I read that, it helped me to realize God loves us. He's worthy of our praise this morning. Lord, we thank You. appreciate Your Word. I appreciate the time that You've allowed us to be in Your house. And Lord, we thank you this morning for every person that's come this way. Lord, I thank you for the truth of the Scriptures. And I ask, Lord, that you take your word. May it penetrate the heart of every listener. May it, may it permeate the mind of each hearer. And God, may we be reminded of how much you truly love us. I thank you, Lord, for saving grace this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy. I thank you, Lord, for being long-suffering toward us. So many times I've failed you. But Lord, I thank you that there is forgiveness. And Lord, we ask, God, that you'd go with us now as we depart this morning's service and dismiss. Lord, we pray that you would be with those that are traveling, be with those that are unable to be with us this morning due to sickness. God, we pray that you'd strengthen their bodies. Lord, help them and bless those that might have watched by way of the internet. And Lord, we just ask, God, that if there's someone here this morning never been saved, you'll take this, your word and God, show them their need. Lord, we ask, God, all these things as humbly, Lord, as we know how in the name of Jesus do we pray. Amen.